from the intergalactic regions of the Council of Outer Space. Why are your shoes so big? Are those moon shoes? How do we know you for real? Yeah, how do we know you ain't somebody off Telegram Street, some old hippie or something? I mean, that is something we would say, right? <laughs> talking all that outer space junk. That is something we would say, talking all that outer space. But uh, dodge all hijacks at all costs. Dodge all hijack at all costs. You should know what it is right now. Shalom to the tribe. Let's go. <laughs> Where are you? I mean, you don't know that. See, for real. He might have something going for him. Yeah, we show them. Oh, what kind of shoes is that you got on your feet? Yeah, walking around all these funny clothes. Shoot, I know I'd probably take off running. I see somebody walking down the street coming, talking all that mess to me, talking about going to outer space. Yeah. I'm gonna be what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. What it is. Yeah. 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 We don't know what you are. <laughs> How do you know I'm real? Yes. I'm not real. I'm just like you. You don't exist in this society. If you did, your people wouldn't be seeking equal rights. You're not real. If you were, you'd have some status among the nations of the world. So we're both myths. I do not come to you as reality. I come to you as the myth. I mean, <laughs> that was pretty deep, just off the top. I mean, this is not the first time we got this drop. But that was pretty deep. I mean, hardcore, you know, hardcore. We're going to continue to build. Peace to the real ones. Peace to the real ones. Hey, ho. Because that's what black people are. Myths. <laughs> I came from a dream that the black man dreamed long ago. I'm actually a present sent to you by your ancestors. Let's get to it. Peace. I know how we do. Let's just get on cozy. Let's get cozy. Yeah. See, you know, uh, truthfully, I just want to keep everything simple. You know what I'm saying? Free from duplicity, upright, godless, blameless, innocently harmless. Because we know it's going to be a couple of folk, a couple of ghosts, a couple of people. That might see this as an ignorant or uneducated, unsophisticated point of view. We're not worried about them, though. <laughs> All right. Because what we're talking about is something that's simple. Something that's plain. Something that's unmixed. <laughs> we just getting straight to the point. All right. Straightforward. What some might refer to as too blunt. It seems not to have had the simple minded meaning. All right. 
We're coming from a free, from pride, a humble, a meek point of view. We're coming from a sheer, all right, clear, easily understood, all right, modest. not really complicated and if you can vibe with that then you know obviously this one's for you because we just picking up where we left off this is part two all right so with that being said and if it's all right with you, let's take off. So as you can see, um, where we gonna start off today is exactly uh, where I started off myself. And I was just really digging on a couple of things. I was caught in between some, some thoughts you know what I'm saying? And it just made me wonder, like, you know, a lamb, right? And why does lamb have this, you know, certain significance to it, this specific, um, you know, reverence? And I'm just like, what is, what is a lamb, right? Like, what's its meaning? And it, just how it goes, you know, for those who are already aware of how the natural ones get, I mean, we just tend to, to sift and flow, right, with the channel, that is the stream of the way, the wata, and, um, you know, digging on it, I'm like, okay, lamb, and off the bat, you know what I'm saying, they tell you that it's a symbol of Christ, and I hope you're ready to dodge all hijacks like Barry Sanders. I hope you, you suited and booted. <laughs> but okay, you know, the lamb of God, right? Typified by the paschal lamb, the paschal lamb, and um, dealing from the late old English. And it's referred to or applied to gentle or innocent persons. Gentle or innocent persons, not necessarily just gentle or innocent, but especially applying to those young, youthful, right? I mean, real childlike. But what's interesting and what really got me flowing on this particular build today was the fact that, as you can see right here, right from the mid 15th century, it says of persons easy to cheat. And I'm like, a person's easy to cheat. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay, I can see from a surface level. A surface level will make one think of, you know, relationship, right? Of course. Because when I went to actually look for this term, that's all they were referring to is relationship cheating and cheating and, you know, relationship. And it's just so much buried onto that. But... I got the vibe, the frequency that this is not exactly what they're referring to. They're not necessarily talking about cheating in a relationship, so to say, you know, so to speak. And it, it just was like, hmm, you know, and from there, man, we get to blasting off in the ether bus, you know, and uh, shout out to everybody in the ether with us right now. I was like, person's easy to cheat. Lamb, and it's crazy how it didn't mention anything about an animal, so to speak. It didn't say anything about an animal, right? It's not mentioning anything about an animal, which is kind of crazy because um, it's only common to the Germanic languages and it has no certain cognate outside of them. So, 
I guess one can say it doesn't exist outside the German language, which was why I was... <clears throat> and when it comes to the hijack of the extracurricular, uh, the additional, that which has been added on, normally hearing that German sums it up. Although, you know, we cannot forget about Aboriginal Germans. Just for sake of keeping with the script. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> so, um, we gonna continue. Anyhow. So, most specifically, um, when I think of land, this is what kind of mine, right? Like, straight up. Alright. This comes to mind. And I'm just sitting back and I'm thinking like, I don't know if I like the setting of this meaning, the setting of this message, right? I mean, honestly, I'm really sitting back and I'm like, I don't, I don't like how this is making me feel. <laughs> All right. I'm, I, I'm, it's a bit perplexing and puzzling because of, of the implication. I mean, we know when it comes to Isaac, right? He was, he was still youthful, but he wasn't a lamb. Even if it was a foreshadowing, but I can get it, right? But Isaac, if I'm not mistaken, was a man, or at least on his way, give or take a good 18 of today's times, right? Going forward. I'm not sure if Isaac in this example, especially in the scripture, uh, the way it's already been you know, pushed out to us. I don't know if that would equal equal a lamb. You see what I'm saying? The comparison, the level of innocence, so to speak. But okay. We know Abraham's sacrifice would have been great considering that he was in his old age his elder age having already been the father at an old age right him and his wife thought it was impossible and um for him to be challenged right and tested on actually offering up his only son <laughs> goes to show a little parallel right his only son at an old age of life so you can go back and double play that too as well right because you're talking about what is being referred to as the most high right so if you're looking at that contrast elder in the years right not not this is nothing new to the most high creator this experience is nothing new elder in experience in years having to give up his only son <laughs> in his youth so to speak but i'm saying this because would I go ahead and refer to Isaac as a lamb? You know what I'm saying? As a sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb at that. I don't know if that term is really settling because it's giving off a predator vibe hidden beneath the detail 
Yes, I get it. Young wolves go after the lambs. But to be likened onto a lamb, it just made me want to dig deeper. So we're going to dig deeper. Shalom. All right, so here we have sacrifice. All right, sacrifice is obviously the offering of something, especially a life. Specifically to a deity as an act of propitiation, homage, etc. That which is offered to a deity in sacrifice. All right, sacrifice or offering. Now, as you see, sacrifice is also again tied in to this energy, right? To a Christ energy. And I'm thinking like, man, a sacrifice is tough because you're purposeful you're purposefully getting rid of a life. without it being necessary in that sense. And I know that's how it sounds, right? But what's the point of a life if we're comparing lambs, so to speak, right? Lambs, so to speak, and it being in its most pure innocence to be sacrificed, to be offered, and keep in mind this term, right? To a deity. To be offered to a deity. To be sacrificed. So my thing is, it's like, okay, what and why was something or a deity require this? I mean, you know, keep it real. And considering that a lamb is just a baby version of that animal. It made me want to check up on the adult version. Because why aren't we talking in a dork, in a, in a, an adult format, right? As adults. So I got a sheep. A sheep is one of the domesticated species of the animals most useful to humans. From this etymology, you gotta keep it mind. We we are talking specifics, <laughs> all right. We are talking specifics, but let's 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 flow with it. So here we have it's a word of unknown origin. Hmm. It is not found in the Scandinavian language. And its closest is the German, as we can see, they're, they're relating it to the Danish and the Dutch. But we're still dealing with a lot of German. And this is their way of relating it back to lamb, all right? So keep this in mind, because we're back to lamb and they actually have a different word, which is ew. All right, ew. Now, Lamb was telling us <laughs> that sheep, I'm sorry, that Lamb meant Person's easy to cheat. Person's easy to cheat. To cheat. All right. So dealing with sheep, it's like okay, we're dealing now with a stupid, timid person. So lamb had people who are easy to cheat. Sheep has timid, stupid person. 
And then it's the sheep that need the shepherd, right? That needs to be guided. Is it because the sheep are stupid? Because the sheep can't think of themselves? Or is this specifically just in the sense that sheep flock together peacefully? I couldn't really, really get a dig on this. You know, it's not leading me to anything substantial. You know, and I'm really, I'm really building on this. I'm like, man. You know, lamb is a young sheep, so we're talking babies. Obviously, as we can see, right, babies, it's the baby of an animal. Sheep being domesticated. Again, pay attention to this term, domesticated. All right. A person who is easily or too easily influenced or led. All right, so I guess by the time you're a sheep, you're just dumb and stupid. <laughs> I guess that's what they're telling us. You start out as a lamb, something that's, I guess, easy to cheat, right? Something that's easy to cheat ends up being something stupid, timid, too easily influenced or led. Very interesting terms when considering that they want to tell you this Christ energy belongs to this particular term or animal. So it made me wanted to know, like, what is the origin of this sheep? And of course, we always dealing with the origins over here at the naturalist. So um, let's see what we got. Shalom. So while, you know, trying to figure out what these sheep were or what these sheep are, I came across what is referred to as a mouflon, right? And a mouflon is actually a wild sheep native to Cyprus or Caspian region from eastern Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan, <laughs> and Iran. It is thought to be the ancestor of all modern domestic sheep breeds. All right, so a lot of what we know of today of a sheep, it is said that this mouflon is the ancestor. All right, we can see. Now look, look at, you know, its color. It's coat and everything, right? The fur. Also, look at its habitat and how it easily blends in. <laughs> because whenever we're talking about something indigenous, we're always talking about how it also can blend into its environment, right? So that's always something to keep in mind. That's always something to pay attention to. So Ahab, for that moment of reflection, but we're talking about the original. All right. Now check it out. It has reddish to dark brown. Reddish to dark brown. Pay attention to the, to the description. You see right here for this one. Reddish dark brown. All right. And, you know, just by doing my thing, paying attention to everything. Um, I'm scrolling down. And I see that it says to see also the Castle Milk Moret. Castle Milk Moret. All right. So I check on that. <laughs> and, you know, today is going to be a, a 
it's always a tribal flow for sure. You know, especially when we're talking about the tribe, that is you. A hot 432. We always we always having a tribal flow. But today this is for the whole tribe. Alright? For the copper color ones. On all sides. Alright. And as you can see, it says the breed's name refers to the Castle Milk Estate on which they were bred. All right. And the Lowland Scots word, Morit, which refers to the light tan or reddish brown color of their fleeces. All right. Of their fleeces. Reddish brown. The more red. Alright, the more. Now, you know, it's crazy because just looking at this male sheep, it's like, you know, we, we pretty much the same complexion. <laughs> we, we pretty much the same complexion. I can see that. I can see that, you know, without a doubt. On this side, take one to no one. But that's what this flow is for. You know, because we just getting acquainted with ourselves when we're looking at the natural world. And we're looking at the environment and the environment around us, right? So, you know, I thought that that was kind of deep because it's giving me context now on certain terms. And it's a trip how this, you know, drop actually took me further than where I intended to go because remember we were digging on land and trying to figure out the significance between this sacrificial sheep right and it was in this term that it made me realize like damn they like to play with the terms and you know we fight within ourselves over these terms and we bicker back and forth but it's all referring to the same thing it's all referring to the same thing, especially if you're just getting here from part one. Because we touched all of this in part one. We've been touching on this for years now. As a whole, as a shot by time. We've been touching on this for years. But the more red refers to the light tan or reddish brown color of the fleece. Alright, we're just talking about a ram. Right. Now I think it's crazy how they refer to this as a sharing, right? And we were digging on simple. And simple had the word shear. <laughs> that kind of caught my attention right now, you know, as we're digging on it. We're just talking about that Moret, Castle Milk Moret to be exact. So, hey, Hob, I hope everyone's getting cozy. You know, this is just the beginning of the build. If I showed you all the tabs, you'd be like, man, and we're going on a journey. So even if I have to chop this up, it'll be chopped up and it will be put into installments just like that. But, you know, I'm energized with the tribe. It's been a while. It's been a good while, almost a whole year. A whole entire year since I built with the real one. So I'm going to keep it going with the energy. We're going to keep it flowing and magnetizing in the ether just for you. Just for you. <laughs> Aha, Mashallah. So here's where this joint starts to pick up, take off, all right? Because it took all this digging for me to get to this point where uh, <laughs> we come across fleece. Okay, so fleece was one of the words that was attached to lamb. And of course, sheep. When you think of sheep, you think of the fleece, right? They're fleeces. So for the noun, we got wool coat of a sheep, right? Wool coat of a sheep. And the fleece always reminds me of the hair, right? The up top. <laughs> for those that grow, you know, 
the tree heads, right? Look like bushes. <laughs> Fleece, wool, fur, silk skin. Of uncertain origin. Once you get out of the Middle Dutch, the Middle High German, it gets a little obscure. But from the Proto Indo European language, it also has a meaning to pluck a feather, a fleece. Fleece meaning feather, something feathered down. Alright. Which is also understandable because you pop out in the fleece that's full of feathers, you, you feather down, whew, you, you on point, right? You doing your thing. I can see that. A little Quetzalcoatl flow. For sure. But what caught my attention was the verb action of it, right? Which had a meaning to strip. To strip a sheep of its fleece. It says to cheat, swindle, strip of money. And I'm like, what? Which was crazy, right? Because when we were building on lamb, lamb was a person easy to cheat. Easy to cheat. So now it's coming to full perspective and fleece. And fleece is dealing with cheating to swindle. To strip of money. And now it's getting interesting. Right? Now it's getting interesting because it's like uh, now I see what they meant by that in the first place. And I knew it was something else to it. You know, I was already getting the vibes. I knew it was something else to it. I'm like, this can't be its initial meaning, you know? No way. No furry Bob. So, you know, with that I'm like, all right, now we're building. We're getting somewhere. And we're going to continue to get somewhere because now we have somewhere, something of a foundation to build from. Which is why I love doing these drops, right? I love getting in these moods and these modes with the, with the tribe. We're, we're so close-knit, you know, but it's so impactful. And it's a beautiful vibration from this point because it's just like... You can't make this up, right? I'm digging, I'm surfing the wave, and I haven't done so in such a long time. I've been so distracted, dealing with, with all sorts of tribulations and obstacles and adversities. But I'm still here. Oh, wow. Still breathing, you feel me? Yeah. So, um, we're going to continue on, right? Because... Now we got some work to build on. So with that being said, I jumped into Swindle and immediately now we get it cracking, right? Now we're cracking off. And I'm like, okay, it says to cheat or to defraud. To cheat or to defraud. A back formation from swindler, which is cheater. An act of swindling fraudulent scheme. All right, a fraudulent scheme. So now, why would sheep and, and lamb have a connotation of swindle to it? Fleece, fleece being to swindle something. These are all hitting meanings. Right? Are you being swindled out of something right now? Are you being cheated out of something right now? Is somebody defrauding you? American Negro, I would say so. I would say your identity, because remember, you're just a myth. <laughs> you're just a myth, a mythos, All right? Swindle, something that is to cheat, to defraud. So you have been cheated out of your history you have been cheated out of your birthright out of your ancestry out of your culture very interesting especially those putting on the sheep 
energy. Very interesting. We'll continue. Peace, peace. So the noun version of this swindler, right? One who cheats others, who practices fraud or imposition. A giddy person, extravagant speculator, a cheat, to be giddy, to act extravagantly, to swindle. To be giddy, to languish, disappear. Now those are some strong definitions right there, right? Strong definitions and similarities. And you know, oof, I guess it's giving me a feeling of, of giddy, giddiness. And I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, but it's a trip how these words mean these things because we're just building from sheep. All right, we're building from sheep. So let's see what this giddy is, right? This giddy. Giddy is an insane, mad, stupid, perhaps literally what? What? Possessed by a spirit. Possessed by a spirit. If it is from pro, if, if it is from Proto Germanic, it is possessed by a god. All right. Possessed by a god. Meaning having a confused swimming sensation. A dizziness, a form of dizziness, a dizzy spell, meaning elated. That's deep. That's deep because we're getting this from swindles. Well, people who like to swindle you are giddy people. Insane, mad, stupid. Possessed by a spirit, a god. Did you know about this? Did you know about this, my tribe? Did you know that this was in reference to that? I didn't. Giddy, huh? We're talking about dizzy. Dizzy is the state of feeling foolish or stupid. Dizzy, to be foolish. A whirling sensation. Almost like a trance, right? Thoughtless, heedless. It's very interesting. Defective perception or wits. But what's interesting is how it goes back into this dust, vapor, smoke to rise in the cloud. That's very interesting, especially from the drops before. Mmm. That, that, that kind of got me right there. But, you know, considering we're talking about giddy, which is coming from swindle, right? Which is to, to, to cheat, to defraud. All right. So this is what a giddy person would do. Let's see what else that we got. It also said languish. All right, languish. Fail in strength, exhibit signs of approaching death. To be listless, pine, grieve, fall ill. To be weak or faint. To be love sick, grieve, to lament, grow faint. Languish. Language to exhibit signs of approaching death. That's pretty deep within itself. So all of this is connected back to fleece. Fleece. All right. Which is to cheat and to swindle. To strip of money. Keep that in mind. To strip of money. Right. Aren't you being stripped? So this is what's happening, right? In a sheep mindset, all of these things are attached to you. All of these things are attached and applied. I 
I'm like, man. All right, so we're going to keep it going to the next one. All right. This is some of the images that I got while looking up language. To be trapped in, right? (laughs) It's interesting that this is the picture, too, because these look like what would be referred as little lambs. Right? The innocence of such. In the in its youthful stage. Crazy. So the youth being put into language. This is this is pretty intense. This is pretty intense. Right? When you just sitting back now, I love to be in that Wata. And it's kind of crazy because I don't, I mean, I guess I can see how this can be something negative, but I like to be in the Wata just like that, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I find, I find peace in such things. But nonetheless, we're talking about the state of language. You now you just let it go. It doesn't matter anymore. You're drifting away. Right. And um you know with those things they were saying something, right? Man, all of this that calls in size with language. And it's, it's, it's crazy. It's definitely crazy because it makes me think, right? It is said even to show signs exhibiting death, which is terrible. So, you know, I did my part. I'm scrolling down. All right. I'm I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And. um, We'll see. You know, I happen to come across an image, and this image is kind of what took me into another rabbit hole within this one journey, right? That image is this. You know, and I'm sitting up there like, huh? Because in the word language in the exhibiting signs of showing death I came across another term and it took for me to see this to make me realize oh I'm on I'm on that same wave that same frequency right because there's a word that describes this and he also looks like this and if you're following along and you're in sync with the flow. Go ahead and drop that term that I'm thinking of. But I mean, I really sat back and was like, damn. Because now it's getting there, it's taking me there. It's definitely taking me there. So let's see what we got. Peace to the real ones. Alright, so far as that term goes, 
the one that I had in mind was Grim. Right? Grim. Which they say means forbidding or uninviting. Right? A depressing or worrying to consider. Something ghastly, something horrible, horrendous, terrible, dreadful. You know, this is what I felt with, with language. All right. And remember how, you know, it, it looked. All right. Let's see. Can we get it back? All right. You see? So when dealing with Grimm, he has a certain look, right? show you right here real quick <laughs> yeah all right as silly as it as it is but peep it peep what he's dressed in all right and peep how he looks all right because we're talking about this so sad grim alright which is what brought me here cause I'm like yo what is that thing in his hand and why is he always walking around with it right like what's the purpose like, what's really the purpose and um <laughs> my mind is always searching for the why. I'm always asking a question, which always leads me to an answer. It's called a scythe. And it's an aggregational agrigo, agricultural hand tool for mowing grass or harvesting crops. Alright. It is historically used to cut down or reap edible grains before the process of threshing. Excuse me. The scythe has been largely replaced by horse drawn and then tractor machinery, but is still used in some areas of Europe and Asia. Reapers are bladed machines that automate the cutting of the scythe and sometimes subsequent steps in preparing the grain or straw or hay. All right, the word scythe derives from Old English side. In Middle English and later, it was usually spelt scythe or scythe. However, in the 15th century, some writers began to use the S-C spelling as they thought wrongly the word was related to the Latin cinder, meaning to cut. Nevertheless, the scythe spelling lingered and notably appears in Noah's Webster, Noah Webster's dictionaries. Alright, so this scythe was what they used. And I'm like, hmm, why would this be attached to a giddy person? Alright, because that's what we were digging on. Someone who was giddy, which is possessed, right, by spirit, by God. And we all know who this Grim is, who's supposed to be the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper is known for bringing death, which was the language. To exhibit signs of approaching death. This is the approaching death, right? The approaching death. But I wasn't necessarily satisfied with what I was getting from the scythe. I felt like I needed more. You know? I needed more of the origin. You know? 
know, but look at these things. Alright. So he's going around cutting people up and snatching souls. Also goes to show you what's really meant, right? Because if this is a normal household tool, <laughs> just saying, man. Sometimes it's not as superstitious as you think. All right, if this is supposed to be for chopping down grass, why is it used to harvest souls? Hmm. All right, it says it goes back as far as 5,000 BC. All right. So, it was right here where I realized, like, okay, we got other aspects of this site in different cultures, right? That we can now go ahead and examine and compare as we continue to expand our foundation and our, our frame of thought. So, I was led to this tool or this sword called Harp. And it's a type of sword or a sickle, a sword with a sickle protrusion along one edge near the tip of the blade. The harp is mentioned in Greek and Roman sources and almost always in mythological context. All right. Let's see what we're dealing with. So that's the harp. The harp, scythe, or sickle was either a flint or an adamite diamond, all right, and was provided to Kronos by his mother Gaia. We're talking about Saturn and Earth. So, here goes their little version of mythology, the mythos from the Greeks. Which ties us right back into the son of Ra. Or Sun Ra. That intro we got in the beginning, right? That all you black people were just myths. <laughs> okay, but I still needed to dig more on it. I needed more information, which led us to the Kopesh. Kopesh is an Egyptian sickle-shaped sword that developed from battle axes. All right. So you can see how it's always from a borrowed context. These things have their inspiration, and then their inspirations have meaning. All right. And it says that it is found in the blues. So, you know, I'm digging on these things. And this goes back pretty far, right? 1300 BC in comparison to the 5,000 years from the site. The etymology also states that the term Kopesh is derived from leg as in leg of beef which is interesting keep in mind because we'll touch on that in a bit this leg of beef all right so i'm sitting back and i'm like damn all of this from sheep <laughs> you know but bear with me because we're talking about a specific spirit in this particular moment that brought on these tools or these weapons of choice. All right. This Nablus. Now 
Papa Loose. It gives us some pretty good, solid background, which, you know, as you'll see, it took me into another rabbit hole. And this is oh so many within this one drop, right? Because this is how it, 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 it actually goes with your man natural when you start from the way. Hey, hop to the tribe, peace to the real ones. All right. So now we're put back into antique time. And it always works out this way when I'm trying to find out the origin of something. You can never find it with the German or the Greek. <laughs> you always got to go back before that. All right. And that's what I so happened to do. You know, I was reading, I was reading, I was reading. And, um, you know, things just start hitting me. I'm like, oh, snap. I got to get on here and talk about it with the tribe. So, you know, there's a lot of rich history that we're now about to crack off into. Let's see what we get. Peace, peace. So, from what we were building off, which was from the Nablus, right? Or the Nabulus. I was uh, redirected to this spot, right? Which is how we, we actually got to this tab. And getting to this tab, you know, I'm like, all right, cool. Because what I'm now able to do, again, is, you know, put things back into perspective. And I know you're going to be like, Nat, what's this got to do with the American Negro? And I'm going to say, hold up, hold up. Because <laughs> it's always about you. It's always about you. You know, but this is just the conquest of Syria, right? From the Muslim or Arabic perspectives. Now, what you guys have to keep in mind is that at a point in time, all of these terms refer to an original people, all right? But have been hijacked so bad as of late that now it all represents a form of a hijack. All right, but that always wasn't the case. Just the infiltration is so bad that it's hard to separate the hijack from the original. And that is something that a parasite does. So obviously these parasites are very good at what they do. So as you can see, it's the conquest of Syria or the Arab conquest of Syria. All right. And this was a part of the wider Arab or Byzantine Wars, which was brought under Arab Muslim rule and developed into a provincial region of Balad al-Sham. And it says clashes between the Arabs and the Byzantines on the southern uh, Levantine borders of the Byzantine Empire had occurred during the lifetime of Muhammad. All right. And even then, with the date given, it's still pretty recent. But what I'm going to do is use this as a ruler or a reference, so to speak. Because here, we get to build on on this holy war or what's referred to as an actual race war believe it or not which is what you know they're trying to lead up to again with this whole Armageddon thing right 
Because that's what Armageddon is about, the so-called race wars. Okay, so this is still pretty new. But, like I said, it's, it's what led me to where we're going. So, continuing on, I'm digging on this Arab and Byzantine wars, right? Because although terms like Arab and Muslim are casually thrown around today, they were once used as ways and terms to describe you. All right. So there are things being referred to and referenced with that apply with these terms that I guess today are completely forgotten, but has a lot to deal and do with the shaping and framing of things, with the framing and shaping of our modern world. All right, so these wars were back and forth, you know, between the so-called Syrians, Assyrians, which have more of a Persian, Indo-Aryan feel. We'll touch on that later, right? And, you know, also keep in mind, there are some of the light-skinned stock, those that we would consider to be European today, at least genetically, who spearheaded a lot of this as well. Because we're going to get to the origin of these warlike tribes in a sense, right? But, you know, we're just digging on the term because my whole thing in building on this now that I'm seeing Arab and Arabian and Arabic was the actual term of Arab. All right. Now, the Arab, the Arabian Peninsula is called or referred to as the Island of the Arabs. So just keep in mind that we're talking about Arab Wars, right? And we're digging on the Arab inhabitants use the North and South Division. All right, so if you're stemming from part one, this should, you know, start to ring bells because we're still talking Northern and Southern Kingdoms. Okay, but what we're getting equating with is this land that is given or referred to being as land of the Arabs. And we're going to touch on just what that means in just a bit. All right, but we're talking about a landmass. And it's, it's anchored in, in time, right? So we can have a reference as to the ancient world. Because dealing with this stuff can take us back into an ancient or a time of antiquity. And all these other civilizations we can't do that with. All right, so we're going to continue. So here we have the Tamud, right? The Tamud or the Tamud. And the Tamud were an ancient tribe or tribal confederation in the pre-Islamic Arabia. All right, so this is before... This is before Islam. Right? And Islam as we would know of it, not to throw any shots of it or any shots on it. Um, we're just stating that this is a reference to a people who would be referred to as the ancestors or the early Arabs that were there before Islam. Because with Islam has a lot of different dividing factors outside of the actual people. All right, because Islam deals with an actual bloodline. 
a lot of people want to ignore or forget that, but it does, right? So see, as we're dealing with the pre-Islamic sources, it says that uh, the word Tamud appears in the annals or the annals of the Assyrian king, King Sargon II. All right, and it says the Tamudi, the peoples are mentioned together with the Ifa, the Ibadidi, and the Marsamani as part of the distant dwelling Arabs who knew neither overseers nor officials and had not brought their tribute to any king. All right. So when you're thinking about the distant de desert dwelling Arabs, to me, I think about the ones that are covered up. You can't really see their faces. They're riding camels and they're normally rich, dark, complected people. All right. Rich, dark, complected people, rich, complected people. And, um, We're talking about pre-Islamic Arabs, all right? And we're talking about from the time of Assyrians, which goes way beyond what we were talking about earlier. Okay, so we jumped, a, a, I mean, almost a thousand years backwards, not more, probably 1,500 years, all right? <clears throat> Then what we were getting right here. Is this the one? Hold on. Okay, probably not this one, but well, you know, here you go, see. This is the six thirties. We jumped. Like I said, almost 1,500 years backwards. You know, according to their their hijack timeline, you got to keep in mind, um, I said we was going to keep it simple. So I'm just using a simple material to catch the obvious lies simply. It's simplicity for me, and it's a, it's a smooth, sweet dance. <laughs> All right. So here we have these ancient peoples now it is said that um, you know by the Islamic faith and those peoples of their origin I think they were referred to as the Sali right um, let's catch it. It says Arab Islamic sources state that the Tamud were an early Arab tribe that had gone extinct in ancient days. Tamud is mentioned 23 times in the Quran as part of a moralistic lesson about God's destruction of sinful communities, a central motif in the Quran. According to the Quran, the Tamud were the successors of a previous community called the Ad, who had also been destroyed for their sins. They lived in houses carved into the surface of the earth. God chose the prophet Sali to warn the polytheistic Tamud that they should worship the one God. The tribe refused to heed him, saying that the Sali were merely a mortal and demanded a sign from God. God sent down a, a milch or millet camel as his sign, and Sali told his countrymen that they should not harm the camel and allow it to drink from their well. But the Tamud cut its hamstring or otherwise wounded it. All right, and this is, you know, standing out to me as that um, leg of beef, All right? Leg of beef so to speak when we were looking at um, the swords and the sickles 
It says, or otherwise wounded it. God then destroyed the tribe except for Sali and a few other righteous men. The means of God's destruction of Tammuz include a thunderbolt, a storm, a shout, and an earthquake. The shout, which is an extremely loud sound, might have caused the earthquake, according to certain scholars. The account presented in the Surah on Namal also mentions nine evil people of Tammuz who are immediately responsible for God's punishment of their people in a narrative reminiscent of the Jewish description of the demise of Sodom. So these people were destroyed, wiped out. Right? And that that sounds familiar. We all know about Sodom and Gomorrah. We all know about Moab and the city of Lot. <laughs> you know, so these are traditions that are left left for us to ponder and speculate on. But nonetheless, it is said that these people were wiped out. Okay, but they were an ancient Arab people of biblical proportion. So now that we know that we're talking about an ancient Arab tribe... Let's see how this all plays, right? Because now we're dealing with Old Arabic, and it's the name for the pre-Islamic Arabic language or dialect continuum. It says these Old Arabic and its descendants are classified as Central Semitic languages, which is an intermediate language group containing the Northwest Semitic languages, including Aramaic and Hebrew. So with just that right there, we can cancel anything that's related to some, you know, anti-Semitism uh, and Semitic hate and anything of that such. Which you know, ten, it can it, it tends to strike a nerve with me because what I don't understand is how someone can be anti-Semitic by mentioning Khazars or Jews or particular people. Even though Jews and Shem, which is what Semitic comes from, comes from Shem, have no tie. The term Jews and Shem have no connection. Yet we can see a rightful hate displayed on Arabic people still to this day. And that is not considered or classified as anti-Semitism. Even though to be Arabic is to be of Shem and Arabics have a connection that go right back to Shem unlike Jews alright so with that being understood you know we're digging on this particular language because <laughs> What does it say right here? The oldest known acetation of the Arabic language dubbed as prehistoric Arabic language is a bilingual inscription written in Old Arabic, which was written in the undifferentiated North Arabian script known as the Tumatic or the Talmudic B and Canaanite which remains undeciphered like I told you we're picking right back up from where we left off in part one it's always going to come back to these Canaanites man alright I should let you know where we're at on the timeline especially right here at this channel you know how what we're always saying about the channel, but specifically what we was digging on in part one. So now you know who we're dealing with, right? Now you know which people. And you should know already just how Canaan was cursed. It says that Canaan was cursed, right? Canaan was cursed due to his uncovering and encroaching of property that was not his. 
we get this in the book of Jubilees. But now that we're knowing, and now that we know we're talking about Canaanites, there's a slim distinction between Canaanites and Israelites to the modern scholar. We, as a tribe, know the extreme differences, but they see it as a slim similarity. All right, so we're digging in old Arabic because we're showing the ties to our ancient script, and we're still talking about the script, as you can see, right? Let's highlight it the whole way, because this is just tales from the script. Tells from the script. All right. So, peace. We're gonna continue this. See, they like to use the term Arabic or Arab and make it interchangeable with Israelite Hebrew, depending on the narrative and what they're trying to hide. It's a very interchangeable word, and it flexes back in, you know, in between to, you know, purposefully hide information. It's, I've seen it, right? I've seen it. So, um, with this said, you know, we're still digging on the Tamud, right? Because we're talking about how they're an ancient people, right? Having Canaanite relation, right? So, we should be know we should know right now we're talking about some rich, complected, melanated people. High in that carbon. They even have the giants, right? Because like I said, they said that these people were destroyed by the most high. And it is to the Islamic belief that they were giants these Tamud. I mean, if we can look at some of their structures, which they said was built to the surface of the earth, right? Let's get that pick. Is that what's happening? It's taking forever. I straight hate it on this. I hate it when things like this happen. But okay. Look, peep out that doorway. Alright. You see how tall, I mean, how small they are? Peep out the doorway. Like, that, that's massive. <laughs> that's, that's extreme. Okay, so the picture that I was looking for. For whatever reason, it isn't available, which is, I don't even know why they would let me click on this. But look how small these people are in comparison to the rest of the building. All right, so that should let you know just what they mean when they refer to these things as giants. The architecture always speaks for itself. As many times we've highlighted that on this channel specifically. All right. So we're seeing context clues of, of, of what the script actually refers to. The only problem is, is when it's considering the Negus, right? The Negus gets no credit for none of this. He gets no attention, no love for none of this. You know, she is completely excluded from society. All right. It's a myth. <laughs> it's a myth. It never happened. All right. 
moving on, we're digging with Mecca. You ain't going to see just what I mean, because we were building on ancient Arabic, right? Pre-Islamic Arabia. Well, here's the beginning of that which is modern, right? Especially that uh, considered to be Islam, which is really the Ish Ishmaelite people, all right? So it says that Mecca is generally considered to be the fountainhead and the cradle of Islam. Interesting. Alright, even though Mecca has an obscure origin for its etymology, which automatically sounds like hijack, and this is, again, no shots at nobody, alright, no shots at nobody, but this is what I mean, because Arabic is a profound language, so the fact that its etymology is obscured, somebody's lying, and, you know, a lot of that would maybe have to do with its history, right? Because when you start digging into the history, early history up to the 6th century CE, I just took you back way past that, 1,500 years, 1,000 years past this. So how come when we're going to the foundation of a city, it only takes us up to the 6th century? Because we're talking about Islam? No. Because Islam is an uh, Ishmaelic people. The sons of Ishmael. The older brother of Isaac. Alright. So if he's the older brother of Isaac, this is way before the 6th century CE. We're talking about a hijack. See, I just gave you a connection with an older people. See, we were dealing with old Arabic. All right, earliest millennium, early first millennium BCE. And we were talking about a specific people. All right, that were connected to all of these languages. So when we go back here and see that the Otis is a script tying in with a specific people and you're giving us that, it doesn't equal. That math doesn't math at all. All right. Like I said, we're going to get at this simple, simply. Nonetheless, this is a pretty pivotal spot as far as land claims in the center behind a lot of confusion and outright war. All right. Continuing on. Here we have the Sabaeans. All right, the Sabaeans are the Sabines. Were an ancient group of South Arabians. They spoke Sabic, one of the old South Arabian languages, and they founded the kingdom of Saba, which is in modern day Yemen, which is considered to be the biblical land of Sheba and one of the oldest and most important South Arabian kingdoms. Now, I mean, let that sit, right? Sheba is known to be Sheba, right? From American gods, you guys know who Sheba is. We're talking about that chocolate, 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 that chocolate, like, what? What of all of all sorts, of all levels, the ranges. I mean, from, from it, it, it ranges, right? We're talking Sheba. If 
from American Gods, man. All right. So if you know how Sheba looked, you know she was rocking with Solomon. Solomon was rocking with her. You know what's going on. <laughs> Let's stop the nonsense, all right? Let's stop it with the fool's gold. I'm talking about the old. The old. So why would something so old water itself down with something so new? You hear what I'm saying? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Put them games down, man. Put them toys down. The kitty should be in bed right now. All right. We talking about 1200 BCE. You see how far we're going back? I mean, we're taking it way back, right? On their timeline. We taking it way back, right? I mean, cuz what is time? Honestly, but a measurement. It says the origin of the Sabean kingdom is uncertain. All right, here's that same timeline that we were dealing with. Okay, and then I guess they were conquered by these this group. And we're going to get on them too. All right, because we're talking about a specific people. All right, see the Saban people use an ancient Semitic tongue. All right, Semitic tongue. So we're talking about Shem. All right, we're talking about Shem. I mean, they're going to go ahead and say that there was a colonization of Africa by these folks. All right. And I guess this is supposed to be a disconnection. <laughs> no land, huh? I guess that's the only way they can say that that happened. Right? As if there's no land right here, even though it's very thin. It's very thin. Right? Whatever. We're gonna keep it simple. So here we are, we're dealing with Sheba and the Sabaeans and the ancient Arabs of a Shemitic tongue, right? We're talking semi, Semites, Shemites. The Hajjaj. All right. So, this one actually falls maybe third or somewhere down the line as far as its importance to the Islamic peoples. And maybe we can see why, because in its history, they have megalithic dolmens. All right? And if you remember our drops from before, you know exactly what this means. <laughs> Neanderthal activity. <laughs> Giant activity. Okay? 
and they'll tend to separate these two because there is a separation my nagas there's a separation it's just nobody likes to talk about the separation but there's a separation because in one classification you have homo sapien and the next you have the neanderthal the troglodyte the scripture says troglodyte our script says troglodyte and it was troglodyte before it was neanderthal all right nonetheless look the northern part of Hejaz was a dependency of ancient Palestine. Palestine being the land of the Philistines. All right. It says the name Algier is the land of stones or the rocky place and it occurs in the Quran and the site is known for having structures carved into rocks similar to Petra. Construction in the structures is credited to the people of the mood. All right. <laughs> you see what's going on? Just like how your script told you that a specific people were wiped out here it is in urban legend. Except, you know, this is all buried and swept under the rug under the term Arab. All right. See, here we get the breakdown between Ishmael, all right, Ishmael, and Isaac. But notice Isaac isn't even mentioned because. When it gets to that, those aren't, never mind. <laughs> okay. But you, you, you understand what I'm saying? You know where we're going. So picking up, we're gonna go ahead and continue. The Hemurite, the Hemurite kingdom. All right. They were called the Homerites by the Greeks and the Romans. Its subjects being called Homerite. They were a polity in a polity in southern highlands of Yemen, as well as the name of the region which it claimed. All up until 110 BCE, it was integrated into the Quanta Bani Banian Kingdom, afterwards being recognized as an independent kingdom according to the classical sources, their capital was the city of Zafar. Alright. The Hemyarite power eventually shifted to the Sana as the population increased in the 5th century. So the kingdom conquered neighboring Saba. And the Saba were the land was the land of Sheba. So seeing how this right here is saying that this is more of a newer type people, it makes sense. Because a lot of the hijack came by way of Indo Aryan. This specific group and specifically those from the steppes, the region of the steppes. All right, so it could be that this this tribe right here specifically integrated into these peoples for a good amount of time before, I mean, look, here we go. Here we go. So look, like I told you, right? We dealing with hmm, depending on how we line this up. If we gonna say these are Jews, 
Even though, look, I'm, you know, they're talking about these folk. All right. So this is the fall. This right here is describing the fall. Right. And this is the same fall that took place in Europe, which is why those natural ones also fell lower. Because this was the fall. This was the switcheroo. Okay, so through this switcheroo right here, and that's really the the, the taking of, of granddad's wallet, right? They took granddad's wallet and said it was theirs and began saying that they were you at this exact moment. All right. And I'm pretty sure these are linked up with the Khazars. So this is where the switcher comes around. It starts right at this point. Keep this city in mind. All right. Keep this city in mind. Here we have the kingdom of Aslan. Alright, and they seem to have a bit of that recent history vibe as well. What I wanted to highlight was their location, and specifically this, <laughs> as we'll see. Okay, so we're dealing with all these different cultures because a lot of them moving around is, is, is similar to the activity mentioned in the, in the script. We're just talking about Shiva. And it says Shiva is an ancient kingdom mentioned in the Hebrew Bible and the Quran. All right. So they go on to tell us that there are so many different breakdowns of Shiva. Understandably, all right, and then you see Islam or the Muslim tradition of it, and then you have Ethiopian Yemen tradition of it. All of this still corresponding back to an ancient time. All right. All right. So here we are. They're talking about ancient Israelites. And the such. And notice how it's confusion amongst here too. Because there's going to always be confusion when we're talking about Shem. Right. When we're talking about Shem. And mind you, these people can only be considered as such by getting onto the table of nations. Alright, this shit still exists today. This is still in existence. And they say the entire family tree of we as we know of know it know it comes from and stems from this. You feel me? So they sat down at the table by removing the original version of that name that they took, which is how European nations in their in their earlier stages have heraldries and coats of arms. 
Like, why would a, a family name have the symbol of a lion to it with no European lion at the time the Europeans were moving around? <laughs> Unless you're talking Israel. And that's right now, you know, to this day. Okay, but we're explaining something. We're talking generations of Noah. Here's Medina. Medina is considered to be the cradle of Islamic culture and civilization. Alright. But its original name was Yathrib. And it was attached to the Confederates. As in Psalm 83. I think so, right? I think Psalms 83. Those who are confederated against thee. I mean, <laughs> you see how them tell some the script come right, right to you. You know what I'm saying? It come right to you because this is what these names mean. All right? And they just so happen to make that same press against you. All right, it says, before the advent of Islam, the city was known as Yathrib. The word Yathrib appears in the inscription found in Haran belonging to the Babylonian king Nebonidus. Nebonidus. All right. Nebonidus. And, you know, I got to digging. You know, I for real got to digging. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And me digging on all of this is where it really gets ju juicy. It really got juicy for me. Right about here. But mind you, I did this backwards. How you're seeing it is the simple version of it, right? It's presentation and simplicity. How I got here was complicated and mad and all over the place. But, you know, no doubt, I did what I had to. So, we're going to see just how juicy this thing gets. And um, hopefully, you're still with me, Shabbatai. Aha, peace, 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 peace to the loved ones. If we got to chop it up, we'll chop it up. But we're going to record this whole thing in its entirety right now. We live with the tribe. And the stream is mean right here in the ether. That is 432. I mean, it always feels like this right before we take off, right before we lift, right before. You know, Nabonidus, right? Meaning, may Nabu be exalted, or Nabu is praised. And this was the last king of the Neo Babylonian Empire, which ruled from 556 BC to the fall of Babylon. All right. To the Achaemenian Empire under Cyrus the Great in 59 and 50 and 539 BC. All right. So Nabonidus or Nabu. Okay, so now we're 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 in biblical time, right? Nabonidus was, to his own apparent surprise, proclaimed king after the dis after the deposition and murder of 
Labashki Marduk in a plot likely led by Nebuchadnezzar's son Belshazzar throughout his reign. Inscriptions and later sources suggest that Nebuchadnezzar's work to increase the status of the moon god Sin and decrease the status of Babylon's traditional national deity Marduk. All right. So this is the influence of the moon. And you know how we feel about the moon right here. <laughs> You've got to drop, you know, surf that channel, man. Go in that Canaanite series and dig on this moon. Because it's no joke, you know. Someone went out their way to make sure that this moon was now the it. All right. And go this history, right? Nebuchadnezzar's father was a man by the name of Nabu Balus B, whom Nebuchadnezzar refers to in his inscriptions as a learned counselor, wise prince, perfect prince, or heroic governor. All right. crazy how how much you know this stuff really ties into everything all right it's a lot of drop it's a lot of drop but nonetheless you know we're still talking Arabia right we're still talking Israel right we're still talking <laughs> yeah, we're still talking Indians, man. We're going to always talk Indians, but right now we're getting this moon god, this sin, right? But let's dig on this Naboo. Because Naboo means announcer or authorized person. Which means prophet. All right, and in Mesopotamia, Nabu is a patron god of literacy. So remember when we were digging on where is it? Fleece? Nah, we were digging on Giddy, and Giddy was someone who was possessed by God. All right, and now we're dealing with Nabu, who this Nabonidus is named after, right? And we're seeing how this Nabu this Nabonidus was a Babylonian king that this city belonged to, which is now modern day Medina, the stronghold for Islam. You see what I'm saying? So it even it's going to give us some context. It says, Nebu wore a horned cap and stood with his hands clasped. In the ancient gesture of priesthood, he rolled on a winged dragon known as Suresh that originally belonged to his father Murdoch or Marduk in Babylonian astrology. Nabu was identified with the planet Mercury. <laughs> All right, and we can't make this stuff up, man. 
Alright, we can't make this stuff up. Alright. So it gave us some references. It says Nabu is mentioned as Nebo in Isaiah 46, 1 and in Jeremiah 48, 1. So we're gonna dig on it. I mean, this is tell some script part two. Ooh. Let's get it. Alright, so here we have Isaiah 46. By verse 4. And it says, Bel babbled down, Nebo stoopeth their idols, were upon the beast and upon the cattle. Your carriages were heavy loading, they are a burden to the weary beast. They stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. All right. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. I mean, wow, man. Wow. This is just verse three. Okay, verse three. Let's run that back. Hearken unto me, O Israel. Hold on. O Israel, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me. Born by me. Born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb the most high is saying specifically that these are his people that the people were birthed from the womb itself from the ether from the wata itself the primordial ooze itself all right which are born by me from the belly which are carried from the womb he's only talking about a specific people yo <laughs> right even to your old age I am he and even to the whore hairs will I carry you I have made and I will bear even I will carry and will deliver you. To whom will ye liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? Ah, oh, that's so deep. To whom of you will ye liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? Do you understand? Do you understand just the death and the heaviness in that? They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and hire a goldsmith and he maketh a god, it a god. They fall down, yeah, they worship. They bear him upon the shoulder they carry him and set him in his place and he standeth from his place shall he not remove yeah one shall cry unto him yet he cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble oh how do we get up there Remember, remember this and show yourselves, men. Bring it again to mind, O oh, yea, transgressors. Remember in the former things of old, for I am Hawa, and there is none else. I am Hawa, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand 
and I will do all my pleasure. Call in a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executed my counsel from a far country. Yeah, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have proposed it. I will also do it. Hearken unto me, yea, stout hearted that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off and my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Man, there was so much to unpack. There was so much to unpack. And, um, you know, we're talking about Bell, right? He's highlighting these false idols. The Most High, Hawad, hates false idols, inanimate objects that are worshipped, right? Here's this Nebo. Probably a foreign derivation, Nebo, the name of a Babylonian deity, also of a mountain in Moab and of a place in Palestine. So notice this is exactly where we're at right now, right? With this whole, you know, lining up of, of, of the script. Okay. So it says, Belth bow it down. And Nebo stupid their idols. Right? Stupid. Oh no, what happened? How we get to John? Wow, just throw us off like that. That's crazy. All right, so here it really threw me off, right? Because it's talking about stupid, right? To stoop, it says to protrude, used only as a denominative from age 7165, right? For alliteration with 7167. To hunch, that is be humpback stoop. Now watch this. So see, we have the definition for stoop. Bend one's head or body forward or downward, lower one's moral standard so far as to do something re reprehensible. All right, and then it says, posture in which head and shoulders are habitually bent forward <laughs> all right and so forth so when we go to stoop in the images all right and we get the meaning of it all right look at stoop posture versus the opposite right Stooping, squatting, kneeling. So this is stooping. This is drone state, right? You're you're damn near a zombie at this point, right? Um, look at the posture. So this is what the Most High is saying. He's being very specific in what he's saying, All right? Stoop. And this is how, you know, my mind starts working. Stoop, right? Let's get that back. Okay. To hunch. That is, be hump back. So let's go back, right? Let's go back and dig on what we was looking at. Stoop. All right. Hump back. Hump back person. 
right? But when we get right here, <laughs> this is where it gets interesting. All right, this is where it gets interesting. Because digging on it, it's like, like what? What? It can't be. 